You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. What is the cost of boldly going where no man has gone before? Guys, this is Systematic Geekology. We are the priests of the geeks. I'm your host today, Christian Ashley, joined by my co-host, Joshua Noah. So Joshua, what have you been geeking out on? Hmm... Lots, lots. A lot of new uh, new Marvel comics that uh, just kind of initiated. So you got a new Miles Morales going on, a restart on Doctor Strange. You got a Spider-Gwen series that just started. Um, a Captain America Alpha War or something's coming out like next week, as well as like Scar. Disney's Scar gets a background story in comics. It's a, it's a good time to good time to be a comic geek. Yeah. How have you been liking the relaunch of Miles' comic? I, I enjoy it, but you know, I personally I feel like Peter Parker's comics have just not been great for for a while, and uh, Miles Morales and Spider Gwen has really stole the show for the for the Spider Verse in my eyes. I'd second that. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, Sad. that's for a different discussion for a comic yeah. book catch up, which you can catch if you're yeah. a patron. But as far as what I've been geeking out on, I just started, and I mean just started. Uh, Max Brooks, uh, not his newest book, I don't think, but The Evolution. Do you know what World War Z is, Josh? I, I know what it is, yeah. Okay, yeah. So he wrote the book. They made the movie. The movie has next to nothing to do with the book. The book is one of my favorite pieces of fiction right now. Uh, but The Evolution is basically kind of a like a found footage Bigfoot novel, and I'm really intrigued by it. So I'm looking forward to see what's coming out later on. Interesting. So, guys, if you haven't figured it out yet, we are going to be talking today about the origins of Starfleet and Star Trek, as well as kind of the role the Federation plays with Starfleet as time goes on. So I'm going to go through a couple of quick facts real quick before we get into the meat of the scenario here. Also, but if they want to hear the origins of Star Trek, the show and how it came together, ah. that's going to be on Patreon with uh, Will, Sari, and return guest Brian Bennett. So that'll be a fun episode, too. Very nice. So, yeah, Starfleet started as a group on the United Earth that was created after, you know, Vulcans made first contact with the Earth, and it devoted itself to the mission of exploration and discovery. And at one point in time, it included organizations like NASA and the International Space Agency. Later on, Starfleet would help fund ventures created by Zephram Cochran and Henry Archer, who, if I remember correctly, is... Jonathan Archer's grandfather, he of the captain of Enterprise, to create Earth's first Warp 3 capable ve- vessel. I almost said vehicle. And an Enterprise to start with a Warp 5. We first hear about the founding of the, Fed- uh, the Federation and consequently of parts of what would later become a larger Starfleet in Star Trek the original series, where it's discovered in the episode Journey to Babel that the Federation was founded by humans, Vulcans, Tellarites, and Andorians, of which we actually get to see the starts of that In Enterprise, before it was unfortunately canceled in its season four, as they were leading on towards the Romulan War, where Starfleet played a role in defending, you know, the galaxy uh, with the Alpha Quadrant against them. And by the time that Enterprise starts, which is about 2151 AD, it is organized and respected enough to have a part in an interspecies medical exchange, which is how we get Dr. Phlox to come along to join the crew, despite him not being human or a resident of Earth. (laughs) Great guy, though. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, Enterprise is weird in that there aren't that many other aliens around, and that's good. I mean, uh, the original series weren't that many as far as the crew was concerned, but it was the 60s. That was a lot of cost and makeup. So that's what it is. Later on, as we see through Enterprise, Starfleet's forces were actually bolstered by the Makos, who joined uh, as a part. They were formerly a part of the United Earth's military forces, but later on, after they kind of integrated with uh, Starfleet, they would be dissolved and become a part of it itself. Even then, from the beginnings to my, especially my DS9 fans, we see the creation of Section 31 from the very start of when Starfleet begins, coming from that section in its own charter that allowed for extra normal means of solving problems. And your mileage may vary on how good or effective they are. Later on, after the foundation of the Federation, Starfleet remains based on Earth. Uh, primarily it's his, uh, its headquarters, gosh, cannot speak today, which is located, unfortunately, in San Francisco. But now <laughs> there are many different alien races from diverse member planets among its ranks and even races from outside the Federation like Klingons and Ferengi. So, Joshua, you told me the other day that you were watching through Enterprise right now. So, like, what parts of Star Trek have you seen? What have you not? Hmm. 
Great question. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Let's see. I, I grew up watching the original movies. So okay. the original series of movies. I've seen some of the original series, but that's a little grading to get through. Just, you know, I'm used to different technology. Um, okay. Uh, I've seen the first two seasons of um, Next Gen many times because I've never seemed to get past those two seasons. And then I forget that I'm watching it and I go back to try and start again. And eventually I gave up. <laughs> Next Gen, just, for whatever reason, it's not that I don't like it. It's just, I guess it's not my speed. I just forget that I'm watching it every time I try um, I've seen Deep Space Nine, love Deep Space Nine, Lower Decks, um, Strange New Worlds, and Discovery. I think okay. That's the other one. So this Discovery, that's the one with the um, the female captain and very Star Wars-y for the first season. Pretty much. Am I thinking right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the one that I think Will needs to needs to watch if he's listening. Will, you got to watch Discovery. That's like, oh, and then of course the uh, the J.J. Abram movies. But yes. We don't Is talk it? about those unless you're <laughs> Is there anything you're looking forward to you haven't gotten to yet? Uh, really, Deep Space Nine was the big one. I kept telling myself I had to finish Next Gen before I got to it. And then I eventually accepted that that's just not going to happen. Man, it's so good. Also, all of the new seasons of Lower Decks I'm excited for and Strange New Worlds. Those two are like some of my favorite current shows. They're awesome. Yeah, I need to get into Strange New Worlds. I was really burnt out by New Trek. Ever since Discovery came out, I was not its biggest fan. And the first two seasons of Picard were not my cup of tea either. But what is happening in season three of Picard right now, I'm really positive on. So I'm looking forward to that. And as far as so much bad about the first two seasons that I'm like, I just don't know if I'm willing to sit through that to get to season three. That's okay. Uh, Mama didn't raise no quitter. So I keep going (laughs) as much as it hurts. And especially speaking of Hurt, the first two seasons of Next Generation, they're really finding themselves. And in my opinion, they're the weakest of the seasons. So if you ever get back into it, you're going to enjoy it. I swear. I just, you know, I feel like I try every couple of years and just (laughs) never sticks. Next time (laughs) I'll just start at season three. Just screw it. (laughs) There we go. All right. So I have a hypothetical for you, Joshua. Okay. Say humanity is able to get out into the stars. We can make contact with other sapient life out there. And you, you, God has just, you know, spread them all over the cosmos. Do you think it's possible for us to create an organization like Starfleet and the Federation? Or are humans just too far gone to do so? I think this whole question is a blasphemy. God clearly didn't say he created other life. He said he created life on Earth. He would have told us if there were aliens, right? <laughs> no, sorry. I, you mean I like he those buried those dragons so in, the, in the dirt and... <laughs> To make us think that the um, dinosaurs were real? Yeah, yeah. I I just hate all <laughs> these arguments so much. Um, <laughs> um, in all seriousness, man, I I think it depends. Um, I think part of, and this is going to be something I'm sure they talk more about on the Patreon episode, but part of what Gene Roddenberry originally envisioned when he created the first Star Trek series, uh, it starts with this premise of there's a f- hopeful future. There's, you know, this this world where Starfleet exists and humans are good, basically. And to him, the barrier for us getting there is time and religion. So remove all religion. Humans don't have religion anymore. Then humans will be better over time was sort of basically his premise. Um, obviously, I don't think that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as a Christian, I'm like, yeah, not, you know, I don't quite buy into that. Um, I think we have different barriers, and um, I think the biggest one this – is, this is where I'm going to sound like a socialist, but I don't, I don't really agree with it either. But I think right now our biggest barrier is probably capitalism. Mm-hmm. You know, we live in a system and learn in a system, thrive in this system where everything's just based on you doing better than the other guy. And as long as that's true, we're, we're never going to be able to do the scientific – lump jumps to get there. And then even if we did, we meet other species. Our mindset is still, we got to do better than the other guy, which is why you have all this, like, this is just my little side rant of why we have terrible politics on some things where it's like, Oh, well we got to be good competitors with the other countries. That's not how money works. (laughs) You you know, like actually we need the other countries to do well so that we can do well, but we don't understand that because we live in our little capitalist bubble in America. So we just keep saying we got to be competitive with China when really We need China to do well so that we do well and everybody else does well. We just need China to be better. (laughs) Better government, I should say. Yeah, I I can agree with that. What I really appreciate about Roddenberry 
is his optimism. And I say this, and I know a lot of people are going to be rolling their eyes after I say these words. I'm an optimistic <laughs> pessimist in yeah, that sure. I want things to be better, but I know how people are. So I expect the worst while also hoping for the best. And Star Trek can really give that to you. And actually, my, my favorite series of all time is DS9. And that's a huge so deconstruction of the ideals Roddenberry made of how can we have this perfect future with no money or not as much chaos and conflict among you know these member species. Like It's a very fragile system, but it's worth fighting for. Deep Space Nine is where you see religion in the system again, too. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's something worth fighting for. So do I think that we're able you know, to move out of this solar system, head to other galaxies or other other solar systems, what have you? I mean, it's possible. And could God have created other life there? Absolutely, he could have. He's far too creative, in my opinion, to stop with just us. I mean, if I were him, I wouldn't stop with us. Surely there's something better out there. But <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I just look at the United Nations right now. And mm-hmm. it's not meant to be the world peacekeeping force like some people believe it to be. It's not meant to be the one world government like your conspiracy nuts will believe because if it is, it's the worst of all time. And we can't get along there. I don't see it happening that yeah. easily when we get to space, if we do. Like, look at all the polarization, even in our own country. Um, and then, you know, this 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 also gets to it, right? Where if we wanted functional leaders in our government and presidents and stuff, basically everybody would just have to agree to truly vote their conscience and stuff. And instead what you have is everyone's convinced that it's either one side or the other side. <laughs> and as long as we convince ourselves of that and act like that, then it's true. But the moment everybody stops believing that, it's not true anymore. So it really comes down to that. And I think it's the same thing as far as like wanting to advance in space, wanting to meet new life and interact with them well. Yeah, until we actually believe better in our fellow man, it's not going to happen. And, you know, I don't think our faith should be in man. Our faith should ultimately be in God. But you, you know what I'm saying? Like if we yes. don't also have faith in one another, you know, if I don't trust the guy who's going out in space meeting the aliens – it's just going to be conflict with the alien still, you know, <laughs> like it's yeah. not going to be any different than now. Just going to be more players involved. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Well, you mentioned religion a couple of times earlier, but like what can like we, religion. yeah. What, what can we as Christians learn from the example of Starfleet as it comes to organization and understanding between different peoples? I'm going to, I'm going to use this word of like tolerance and acceptance kind of stuff, you know, uh-huh. um, in, Maybe some of that's humility. Actually, that's the, I think that's the big thing that I, I like about Star Trek Enterprise so far is like a lot of our problems are that we haven't quite learned that humility part yet that you see some of the captains having in later series, you know, and it's, you know, our way is the best way. We know how to do this. You know, why can't we be have warp five? Why did you hold this back from us? You know, we're so entitled to that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um. And that, that, that's sort of what we see in the church right now, right? Is that our way is the best way. No other way counts. Most churches are saying that the other churches don't really understand the Bible. They don't really, you know, how many times I hear you have to go to a Bible believing church from a pastor. And then when you ask him what he means by that, he basically means a church that believes the Bible in the exact same way that he believes the Bible, believes it's just as literal or not literal as he does, interprets it the same way. You, you know what I mean? Like instead of just saying, I don't know, uh, the Bible kind of says this thing of, um, in order to be safe, uh, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, Christ is Lord. And then we're the ones who topple on all these other necessities for someone to be part of the church and to be Christian, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I think I think that's what the church needs to learn. You know, when we meet new people, it's kind of a go about it with, hey, your way might not be the only way. You might be wrong even. It's insane, right? You know, you, you don't go around assuming that you're wrong. But you have to you have to be able to hold the idea that you can be wrong if you're going to interact with people well. And if you're going to be able to have a meaningful conversation with anyone about salvation, you got to hold in your hand that you can be wrong or else they know that you're basically talking down to them, that you're not actually having real dialogue with them, if that makes sense. I agree completely. I brought the United Nations as an example earlier as an organization that kind of just fails. But if we want to talk about something that really fails... Look at the church when it comes to organization, when it comes to reaching out beyond the, the gaps to say, OK, well, you believe in this. That's not exactly a heresy. Being like, you know, oh, I'm a Baptist. You know, I believe full immersion baptism. That's the way to go. Dunk me under the water. You know, it doesn't save me. But at the end of the day, it's a public proclamation of faith. And there are other people out there 
who sprinkle, others who half submerge, uh, sprinkle children. And at the end of the day, like uh, I, a friend of the show, Kelly O'Sullivan, I make <laughs> fun of him all the time. I call him my favorite uh, baby drowner. And, <laughs> and I don't mean that funny. negatively. I mean it, uh, I mean it very you know, tongue in cheek because I mean, that's what Anglicans do. And I've learned that. <clears throat> And they don't drown babies for everyone. Else. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, let me let me rephrase that. They <laughs> they baptize infants. <laughs> they sprinkle some water on their head. <laughs> they, they, they drown babies. They worship Satan. It's a terrible place. No, that is not what the Anglican Church does. Uh, to defeat my own point, there. Oh, Gosh, <laughs> I just use it as a tongue in cheek kind of joke with him. It's like, hey, you believe this? I think that's weird. But at the end of the day, we can still get along. And what Starfleet yeah. does is it gives that common purpose of we're exploring new life and new worlds. Uh, it's a boldly go where no man has gone before. That is such a cool premise. Like, think of how vast this universe is. All the things we could discover if we just work together. And we should do the exact same thing on this earth while we just have humans. And who knows if we find someone else, we're going to have dif differences with them. But we already have the differences now. Let's solve them first. Let's go to Jerusalem first, then Judea and Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. You know, man. So I do another podcast, the whole church podcast. It's all about church unity. And um, for some reason, you set me up to do a rant about this. So <laughs> don't know why you would do that. Um. So 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 here here's a fun example. Um. I interviewed. Another one of our hosts, um, Keno Kennedy, we're doing a series over on that podcast about church services, right? And he's talking about his service. And when they do the Apostles' Creed, they leave out the harrowing of hell. Hmm. I was like, that, that bothered me for a second. It really did. Because I was like, um, that, then that's not the creed. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's how the creed goes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, you know, I thought about it. And it's funny even asking him. He's like, well, you know, you can or can't or can you can choose to believe that or not we don't think it's ne ne necessary to make everybody say that because not everyone believes that in our church i'm like okay that's still not the creed but okay <laughs> if i get hung up on that that's an issue right <laughs> yes and the thing is when you really think of what christ said about witnessing he didn't say man if you give a great three-point sermon he didn't say you know if you have a good testimony if you really gone through some stuff you know he didn't say if you're willing to go to the bar, then they'll listen to you. He didn't say if you're not willing to, then they'll listen to you. What he said is they're going to know you by your love for mm -hmm. one another. And he said that my people will all love one another. The church is united if you read Ephesians 4. And yet today I'm looking at the church going, um, it's not. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, um, yeah, we, we aren't known for love. We're known for, for perversion, for division, for anger. And it's like uh, something's missing here. And the thing is, Jesus' vision for the church, that we are known by that? What organization on this planet is known for that? None. No organization is known because they're just that well united that it blows people's mind. Yes. To be that is to boldly go where no one has gone before. Amen. And it's possible or else Jesus wouldn't have told us to do it. If it was impossible. That's what I like. I hate so many times people are like, well, you know, we're all human. So it's impossible to really have unity. And I'm like, no, it's not. We have the Holy Spirit and Jesus told us to do it. So let's just do it. <laughs> it just requires work and I don't want to work, Joshua. Yeah, that's that's really what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the same reason why we haven't met aliens. That's just way too much work, man. <laughs> yeah, let's defund NASA. Uh, we'll NASA get here eventually. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Okay. Oh, man. So moving, moving on to a different track. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. So we see – you've seen the movies you said. So in the second yeah, movie, Wrath of Cons. Yeah. I didn't see the next gen movies. That's fine. Now, some of those you're better off. First contact you need to see. <laughs> okay. But part of the training for those wanting to graduate from Starfleet Academy, especially in an officer's role, is the infamous Kobayashi Maru unwinnable battle to see how the cadets handled the experience. So you've watched the movie, so you're familiar with it. Like, how would you handle being put in this no win scenario? Or do you need me to elaborate more? It's been a while. Yeah, go ahead and elaborate more. <laughs> <laughs> so depending on. The, your time and place, there's a, a ship that's calling out, send out a distress signal around inside the neutral zone, could be the Klingon neutral zone or the Romulan neutral zone. You bring your ship there, you're, you're assigned to go rescue the people. Then as soon as you go there, you get closer. Three ships decloak. They're either Klingon or Romulan, depending once again on the timeline. And you're outnumbered, you're outgunned. 
you don't know if this is a trap, probably is a trap. And the choices are like, what do you do in a situation? Mm -hmm. Who do I have on on crew? (laughs) You have your fellow cadets who you assume would be talented Starfleet employees at that point in time. Hmm. But like no, no specifics. There's not somebody I could just ask on team. Oh no. You've got like next to no time to plan this. You know, I got to say, I'm I'm probably leaving the situation. <laughs> okay. I'll probably try to come back later for the rescue, but as is, it seems like I put more lives at danger than I have potential to save if I engage. Yes. I mean, that's certainly what one is, way of what is your going. Answer? <laughs> yes. I mean, there are multiple ways of going about this. Uh, in that scenario, uh, it, it's before, like if anyone ever suspects it being a trap and tries to flee, like your crew will mutiny against you. But in that moment when they appear, like they're attacking you, it's a valid reason for you to flee from that battle. Me, I mean, other than reprogramming the system like Kirk does, I'm not that talented with computers. I would probably just use that other ship as a shield. And if I could try and fight, and if not, we're getting the heck out of there. And I'm going to try and rescue as many people as possible. But chances are I'm still going to die in that mission. Yeah. The um, see if, if there were less people on, like if it was just me on the board, you know, like if I'm like just dry, driving like a Star Fox's ship for some reason, <laughs> I'm just fighting them. <laughs> like, okay. sure, I put my life on the line for somebody else. Sure. But if you're asking me to put my crew's life on the line, ah, that's a little dicier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, infamously, like Kirk, like I mentioned before, he reprogrammed the system to where. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were all in awe of who he was. They feared the great Captain Kirk. So they fled the battle, even though they outnumbered him three to one. And like one of the things he says in that film is that he doesn't believe in a no win scenario. And I believe later on in the Avengers, Iron Man says something very similar uh, to Cap. And well, sometimes, unfortunately, there is a no win scenario. And at the end of the day, we just got to take that L. And that's one of the things they try. That's why it's part of the training in Starfleet is to put you in that scenario and see where your mind goes. So do either of us pass? <laughs> I mean, the, the goal. Yeah. Yeah. The goal is to see what you do. So unless you do something like highly treasonous, like, hey, like, hey, we're going to join your side now. Or like <laughs> you blow up. Uh, it, there's actually been some cases, I think, in extra canon where people have blown up the Kobayashi Maru because in their minds, oh, it's obviously been set up. The survivors are dead. And if I kill them now, it's a mercy killing because they'll just end up in a Klingon slash Romulan prison. And it's been like, okay, we may have to do an ethical concern with you, but you pass. So it's just to see what you do in that scenario. You know, I I suppose it would be possible to pretend like you're on their side just long enough to to get what you need and leave. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure there are scenarios. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So that's that. Another thing that's kind of brought up within Starfleet itself is when people get higher positions like There's a classic trope in Star Trek of an admiral who abuses their authority, goes mad with power to hinder the actions of the people under their command, or even sometimes they commit outright treason, like uh, with Admiral Jameson and TNG as he's selling weapons to escalate a conflict. And we get Admiral Layton in DS9 acting in tremendously bad faith to declare martial law on Earth due to the changeling threat. Like, what is it about power, being in power, that causes people to go rogue? And what can we do to prevent this in our own lives? If possible at all. You know, I think it's interesting that you kind of see a few times, which I know this happened a bunch of them, but the one I like the most is Lower Deck so far, honestly. So (laughs) you see Captain Mariner often is in the situation where people think that's what's happening or something suggests that's what's happening. She just doesn't really care what people think. Yes. But then it's kind of revealed that the exact opposite is happening, that everybody else is doing that. And she's trying to protect her crew. And and I think, are we trying to figure out how we can prevent that ourselves from becoming power hungry? Or are we trying to prevent other people from becoming power hungry? Because that's two different things. I mean, ourselves too. But I was thinking when I was primarily writing this question, like uh, say those of us who are not in a leadership position at the moment, and we see aspects of a pastor or a deacon or a missionary or what have you, that seems questionable. So... I mean, I'm going to get in trouble here. <laughs> and in a church context, I don't think there really should be a hierarchy. We're all a kingdom of priests. We're all priests, priesthood of all believers. 
Hierarchy just shouldn't be a thing. Um, sorry. <laughs> That's just my belief. It's okay if you don't agree with me. I go to a church with a hierarchy. I understand the need for organization. It's a human thing. It's okay. It's just not something I think should happen. But I think it's okay. Permissible, but not preferable. Um, but given that, and given that people have different roles, whether or not you believe they should have a hierarchy or not, they have different roles, whether or not you think they're more important Christians or not. Um, the right thing to do, according to the Bible, is for two of you to talk to him together and pull him aside and address him. Um, I, I would say you should probably, churches that have roles, have them for a reason. There's someone above the pastor. Ask if the pastor will meet with you and that person, express your concerns, and just have that conversation. Um, and if nothing's done about it and you see the trend continuing, that's when I say, man, just leave the situation. This is not a good situation to be in. It's unhealthy for you, unhealthy for the leader. It's unhealthy for the church. Don't stay in that. Yeah. I mean, as far as Star Trek is concerned, first and foremost here, it's <laughs> time and time again, you see Picard or Cisco or what have you, or who have you, I should say, just dealing with someone who obviously got that from connections or from they were actually really good at their job at one point in time and they got lazy or they got too proud for their own good. And that's something we need to be aware of when we're picking leaders for anything, whether it be for you know youth ministry or small group leaders or mm -hmm. you know missionaries or what have you. And it's going to be hard because number one, I mean, we've got to go over how to judge and we have to learn from the person who taught us how to judge and that being Jesus in the most misquoted verse in the Bible. Judge not lest ye be judged. It's like, no, Jesus is teaching us how to judge there in you deal with your sin, you bring it to God, you ask for forgiveness, then you worry about the speck in your brother's eye, taking out the log in your own. Whenever you are in a position or you know this, this is a thing. Whenever we're choosing our leaders in the first place, um, much like you know, bodily health, typically the best thing to do is preventative care. Um, watch the language someone uses. Are they saying, I want to bring glory to God. I want to do this. I want to help the church. I want to blah. How many eyes are they using in their sentence? Mm. Or are they more, God called me to do this. And I think this is the best way I can bring glory to him. Or like, are they putting God's name first? Are they saying God's name more than their own name? Are they talking more about the people that they care about? Or are they talking more about them and what they can do? And that's, I think that's a big flag. That'd be a huge one. And like with many things, it's going to be trial and error because sometimes you'll suspect something mm. and be completely off base. And you know, <laughs> there are going to be yeah. apologies you have to make after that. And other times you're going to get kicked out just for raising a fuss. And unfortunately, we're going to have to deal with that. I mean, that's a no-win scenario yeah. and as far as that church is concerned, but it's better for that church for something to be said and someone to stand up and be kicked out for it than to just blindly accept it and say nothing. Same thing goes for your worship songs. Mm. I hate worship songs that talk more about yourself and how you can lift God's name up high and rather than talking about God, which bothers me so much. I'm, like, I'm not here to worship me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. <laughs> All right. So moving on to our next point. So one of many criticisms kind of thrown around against Starfleet, especially in a more modern era, is that it's seemingly this military militaristic force that is there in addition to the exploratory and diplomatic things that Starfleet is known for. And some people feel that this inherently makes it a flawed system and it glorifies armed forces and its leaders. Like, do you agree with those ideas? You have something else you want to add to that? Yeah, we, we see Star Trek happening in real time with the Space Force right now. Look at the <laughs> logo. <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> they didn't even try to hide it. Yeah. Which, um, I mean, as we yeah, go into space, we're going to need something like that, unfortunately. Yeah, I um, well, the idea is to explore. And as we explore, I, I don't know, you get into just war kind of theory, right? Um, yes. When you meet new people and you see that they're being persecuted, you see that so ter something terrible is happening out there in the universe. You have the power to do something. Now I'm sounding like Uncle Ben. <laughs> And you choose not to do it. That's your responsibility. You know, with more power comes more responsibility. So as we get this technology and ability to go places, we also have this ability to protect more people. I think if the ability is there, you have to do it. When it comes to the Star Trek canon, when the Makos were first introduced in Enterprise, I was like, finally, this makes <laughs> sense. You're exploring all these other planets. Why doesn't Kirk? Why doesn't Picard? 
have this force of people whose job it is to defend and protect them while they're on these exploratory missions Mm -hmm. in a military kind of setting because they're going to places sometimes that are very hostile. And one of my favorite Star Trek games ever is Star Trek Elite Force, where that's done for Voyager. It's not canon, but it should be canon. (laughs) Uh, And it's sequel as well. They're both really good because like, yeah, sometimes you need people who are good at their job for missions like this. They shouldn't be there every single time, but they should be there especially in the situations like this. And I understand why people are very upset with the idea of you know, Gene Roddenberry's future being being changed in this regard. It's not as idealistic that we need to have a military involved. But at the end of the day, we know what people are like. So, of course, another race, another species that's un, that's fallen is going to do the exact same things. Man, you're telling me if I can go hike somewhere that no one's ever hiked before. Do you really think I'm not bringing any weapons on that hike? I mean, come on. <laughs> you dumb. don't know what's there. <laughs> you have no idea what you're getting into. Like, it, I understand. And I know I'm a very, very conservatively biased person in some regards. And I can be sometimes very sounding demeaning to towards people uh, who are a bit more liberal in that regard. Like, we shouldn't have that. But, like, it's just a logic reason for me. It's like, yeah, why wouldn't they be there? Yeah, I am... Um <laughs> I'm going to annoy some people with how I'm using this, but you know, Jesus had the disciples pick up swords. And then in the garden told them not to use the swords. I'm a big fan of that kind of philosophy of, Hey, uh, if I'm going somewhere, I've never been before. I'm bringing the most firepower that I have. And uh, then there's pretty much no situation in which I'll use it. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to have it. <laughs> Perfect use there. Just in case. All right. So another classic rule within Star Trek is the prime directive. That is, we cannot interfere with the development of pre-warp worlds so as to not negatively affect them. Like, do you agree with this as an idea? Do you think they're a little too, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, stringent? I think systemically it's a good idea. I think individually not necessarily, if that makes sense. Because, I, I agree. Yeah, if I'm sending other people out places, it's like, you know what, let's let's do as little interaction as possible so we don't mess stuff up. But if you, you and your people, and that's it, use best judgment, you know? <laughs> You know, <laughs> I mean, you stole my line. This is when I was going to use to, you know, with great power, there must come great responsibility line. And that's with, <laughs> you know, God, if for whatever reason we're out in the stars and we're more advanced than this alien race we're looking after and we see they're about to destroy themselves in a nuclear war, would it not be more just for me to break that law so that I can help them and preserve life? And yeah. you can argue that all day long, but I'm going to I'm going to preserve life. Yeah, and I definitely think it depends on scenario. In that situation, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I think a lot of the scenarios, which is probably what they had the rule in mind for, um, it's much like helping animals, right? Like if you just start feeding cats outside or whatever else, or you know, you see a sea creature and you just try to put them in the water, a lot of times you do end up doing more harm because that animal actually needed something else. That animal actually needed to learn how to do, hunt for themselves or how to get in the water for themselves, you know, whatever it is. And your interference, though in the moment it seemed like you were doing the right thing and you fixed it, actually caused more harm. And I think that was sort of – that sounds like that would be your initial reasoning to have a rule like that is so that you're not doing something to people and causing them to rely on some technology they don't actually have access to or whatever else that would end up causing more harm in the long run. But I think it became so dogmatic that some stuff like what you're talking about where it's like, I could stop this nuclear war, but I'm not allowed to, (laughs) ends up being what happens. Yeah, I agree with you on the case by case scenario. Like there's a reason this rule should exist. I mean, we see it, especially in the original series all the time where uh, alien races are influenced by something and then we suddenly have a Nazi planet or Mm. something like that. And (laughs) it's a ridiculous idea. But at the same time, it's so easy to see how that could happen with uncontacted tribes and cultures. But the same thing could happen is that they could be negatively affected by something they don't have the context for, for being away from everything. Yeah. Well, and. If it's a completely new species that you're interacting with, you know, much like how we found out that certain lights throw off how turtles navigate and we ended up yeah. destroying the turtle population. You have no idea. You go to this species and it turns out certain sounds that humans make completely destroy their way of existing. And it's like, oh, man, clearly didn't intend that, but there was no way for you to know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good point. So next up. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. Like, what else can I say? <laughs> Uh, hidden in the shadows, we see, especially starting with DS9, because that's where they originate from, is Section 31, a yeah. clandestine group 
devoted to the preservation of Starfleet and the Federation at any cost. Does the world need groups like this to exist in order to maintain peace, or are we diluting our values to allow something like it to continue existing? Well, to sound very conspiracy theory for a little bit, I think that those things absolutely already exist. Indeed, and, they uh, do. I don't think it's doing a ton of good. <laughs> I mean, yeah. well, let's just say it. I mean, the FBI exists, the CIA exists, uh, MI6, the KJB, so on and so forth. All these yeah. organizations exist and have done terrible things in the name of preserving peace, sometimes well, sometimes very poorly. Yeah. And that's the stuff they tell us about. You know, there's stuff that they try not to tell us about. And they've got to have at least been successful once and not letting us know something. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> and yeah, this is our conspiracy theory part of the podcast. And like, look, at the end of the day, I am glad the FBI exists. I am glad the CIA exists. But yep. we definitely need more overhead, more oversight into some of the things they're doing because we can't just have uh, people being toppled simply because they're not playing well with the rest of us or what we say the rest of us should be doing. Also, <laughs> people seem to not understand that uh, organizations also are like children. <laughs> you know, you keep telling the child it can't do a thing or it's going to hurt itself. You can't put your hand on the stove or it's going to hurt itself. And every time it goes to put its hand on the you just turn the stove off. Eventually, that child grows up and burns its hand on a stove. <laughs> <laughs> And if you don't ever do anything to correct them and just tell them things, people just keep doing the wrong thing. And eventually they get burned. Learn that a lot. Hiking with people and camping with people. You, sometimes you just got to let people make their own mistakes and let them suffer for it. I know that sounds awful. It's kind of true unless they want to suffer something worse later on. Um, and yeah. that's where I, I'm anti-government bailouts. I hate the constant raising of the deficit and just constantly getting more debt. It's just stupid. <laughs> I'll second that. As someone who's had to work with a lot of children before, even though it pains me, I let them get hurt yeah. because then most of them, there are some really stupid kids out there, I'm very sorry to say, and I love them dearly. Most of them will learn, oh, I shouldn't do this, even though I was told 10 times over not to do this. Now that I've experienced it, I know not to do this. Yep. So uh, is, is the moral of this origin of Starfleet's episode that I start, we need to let Starfleet burn? <laughs> Saying no, just like any created human system, there are flaws and there are great things about it. And we should praise the good, vilify the evil. I do have a question for you, though. Go for it. Since since this is part of our origin series, I want to I want to really hone in on the origin part. Yes. Um, Enterprise, especially even in like the introduction, like how it shows like technology advancing and like the what is that called? Anyway, um, I thought it was really cool. Do you think that it's realistic, the outline they show of where humanity is and where it would be for Star Trek Starfleet to start? As far as? Like the general like steps of technology it would take to get there, okay. the general like attitude. Because I, I thought that those guys were very American. <laughs> Starfleet, <laughs> like in, in Enterprise, I was like. Well, uh, Roddenberry seemed too far off of people's ideas today. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Roddenberry, when he was creating the original series, he was very influenced by the Navy and how it ran things, and that's why you see, especially early on, the militaristic attitudes, even a as liberal as he could be at times, that Starfleet would have, that the Enterprise would do. And as far as the technology goes and how we as humans go about it, the unification I don't think is ever completely possible. Mm -hmm. uh, unless there's somehow a one world government or even a <laughs> couple that somehow make everything work together and not a dictatorship kind of way. And like, I, I just don't believe that is going to happen by, let's say, quote unquote, the good guys in this world. Yeah, I, it feels like it's missing a step to me of between here and Enterprise. But Enterprise really does feel like a good in between of here in the original series. Where I'm like, okay, yeah, I could see that this is where humans would act. And I can see how where they are from Enterprise becomes the original series, Star Trek. Well, speaking it's of just origins, how we get to Enterprise is where I'm like, nah, I don't know about that jump. Well, one thing that could help you there is by watching Star Trek First Contact, where we see <laughs> it's a time travel movie. And we see part of that where humanity after the Third World War is devastated. And uh, yeah. And we've had a lot of different people, a lot of dictators rise up and people just want something to hope in again. 
And that's one of the themes of the film is finding that hope. So obviously I, as cynical as I'm going to get here, I don't think that's ever going to happen, but for the, what happens for eventually enterprise, the Vulcans establishing first contact with us. I'm sorry. That's a 30 year old <laughs> spoiler. Dang. You're still going to watch the movie uh, and maybe not. Like, like them helping us uh, ascend is how we're able to get to the point in the enterprise. Okay. See, I could see that. I could see that. Cause I'm thinking of like post nine 11, which by the way, there's a really good podcast of like nine 12 or like the day after nine 11 or something. I forget what it's called, but it's great. Hmm. Um, but just how America came together, even though it was for a short period of time, I could see something devastating enough happening to our planet that maybe, maybe we come together a little bit more. And if it just happens to be the right timing that that's when a race like the Vulcans come in, that they could, they could help guide us the right way from there. Maybe that does make sense. It's like, it's, it's, it's sort of like the, um, <laughs> like the really bad analogy pastors do of evolution where like when they want to say evolution's bad, it's like, well, you know, it'll be like dough just happening to fall and then eggs and then milk and then someone just stirred it and it just became donut. And I'm like, okay, that's not what evolution is, but okay. That is what this would be though. <laughs> yes. And it would be yeah. minds behind that process. Oh yeah. <laughs> because, uh, as someone who is big into microevolution, not macroevolution, like I, I still understand uh, the point that evolution is not goal oriented. So we got on the different yeah. path here. And that's unfortunately what a lot of Christians look at evolution as. That's not how it works. It is random change by every definition of the word. Yeah. Random change. And then the worst things just die. It's not that the best things survive, live as much as it's the worst things die. That's where I think, <laughs> I think survival of the fittest was too positive of a phrase. That's where people get confused. It's literally, yeah. it, it should be more like the devastation of the least fit. <laughs> Welcome to our evolution origins podcast. <laughs> where instead of Star Trek, we discuss Darwin. <laughs> All right. Part two. <laughs> All right. So, Josh, do you anything you want to add to this before we wrap up? Um, the rest of Darwin's story after he came up with the theory of evolution is really sad, and you should read about it and learn from it. Yeah, I know. Darwin Origins. <laughs> <laughs> Nowhere near right. as good as Darkwing Origins. Oh, my gosh. He, he did it. <laughs> he took 47 minutes, at least of this recording, and he did it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> is that your recommendation, Josh? No, no. If we're going to wrap up, do it our recommendations. Um, um, the Bird King by G. Willow Wilson. Uh, it's a novel. It's like roughly 400 pages. She is my favorite comic book author. So I just picked up one of her books. And I was like, maybe she's good at this, too. Ah, God, I swear it's one of my favorite books I've read. And I there's definitely some recency bias, but I'm also just like, man. I haven't been this captivated by a story in a really long time. So I got to recommend that one. Very nice. Let's see. The latest episode of Vinland Saga came out today. And I will say as a counter to <laughs> Kino, who was very upset with the lack of violence, is that I actually really enjoyed the Farmland Saga part of Vinland Saga as it's establishing <laughs> our characters after their life of violence. And now the violence is coming back in a very terrible way. It's like, oh, you want the violence back? Well, here's what's going to happen as a result of that. So I I'm enjoying it immensely. I'm just messing with Kino. I think we both enjoyed the series. It's really fun. Check out <laughs> Vinland Saga. I've already recommended it before, but I'll recommend it again. All right. So guys, thank you once again for listening to this. Please head out to our website at systematicecology.org to see our shop. You can also see little tabs for all the hosts there, like what we've been on, uh, the things we as well there's also a section for you to send us future episode topics we look forward to hearing more of those like we've got already gotten some in the past as well guys we have a discord join us there we're more than happy to have you join in the conversations we're having there we have a youtube page at systematic ecology check that out we have our youtube we have our twitter i sorry i said youtube we have our twitter patreon guys if you want to help us out even further please join the patreon we got a lot of cool stuff over there a lot of good work is put into it and guys at the end of the day remember we are all a chosen people a geekdom of priests This was an Anazao Ministries podcast. If you enjoyed this show and would like to learn more about our network, be sure to check out the Anazao Ministries podcast network.